Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, first up today, we have Tim to talk about the AV1 video codec. Please make him welcome. Thank you. Um, so I work for Mozilla Research, um, and this is one of the, the projects that our team has been working on for the past few years. So, if I can get slides to work. Um, just to make sure everybody's in the right room, like start talking about an easy question. What is AV1? Does anyone here not know? All right, good, one, one person. So I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, AV1 is a next generation video codec that is available royalty free. And so I'm going to talk about what both of those things mean. But first, we might answer a slightly more difficult question why did we make AV1? Um, so it turns out there's like a lot of video on the internet. <laughs> um, people watch about a billion hours of YouTube every day, which is over 100,000 years. Um, it, it took 130,000 man years to build the Great Pyramid of Giza. <laughs> so that's, that's the level of effort that our society is, is devoting right now to watching cats. <laughs> um, and about 60% of that is on mobile devices with, with uh, you know, limited data capacity. Um, that's just YouTube. There's, Facebook has millions of videos uploaded every day, billions of videos watched every day, and all of this video is getting bigger, right? So it's not lo no longer just 1080p, now it's 4K, that's four times as much information if it's uncompressed. Um, it's not just 8-bit content anymore, it now goes to HDR, which requires 10 bits, so that's another 25%. Um, so there's a lot of this. Um, and we're estimating it will get even more, right? So 82% of internet traffic by 2021, according to Cisco, and I implicitly trust Cisco in all things on, on what's on my network, right? <laughs> um, so that was one reason. The other reason is that the old way that people used to develop video codecs is, is broken, like it's not working anymore. Um, so what this diagram is, is a diagram of the three different patent pools that are now uh, trying to license patents for HEVC. Um, you can see like some of them overlap, so if you license from both pools, you're actually paying for those patents twice. Um, there's no one patent pool that has all of the companies, so you need to license from all of these things. There's this big collection of companies in the lower left there that doesn't belong to any patent pool, um, except BlackBerry, between the time this diagram was made and now actually joined the patent pool over there on the bottom right. Um, but that patent pool hasn't actually told anybody what their licensing terms are. So you have no idea what that's going to cost. Um, but I have heard that they are going around to individual companies now and starting conversations on how much they'd like to be paid. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you want to deploy that codec, um, Good luck. And, and I should point out, by the way, that, that this diagram was actually posted by the chairman of the MPEG Standards Committee in a blog post he called, A Crisis, <laughs> The Causes and a Solution. Um, and I read the solution, and I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> um, now, we're here in New Zealand, and so some of you in the room may be thinking, but, but patents don't affect me, because in 2013, New Zealand abolished software patents. Yay for you, New Zealand. Um, they did it using this, this language called, where they were saying that, that a computer program as such um, is not patentable, and that was adapted from the UK Patents Act in 1977. Um, and you know, Europe also used similar language to abolish software patents. You might say, okay, well, you know, New Zealand, Europe, like that's maybe that's a big enough portion of the world. I'm just going to live there and be happy, um, and I don't have to worry about software patents. Um, now, I wanted to give some examples of of a New Zealand patent, but actually, like 2013 is not that time, not that long ago in in the legal world, so I didn't couldn't find any good examples. But sort of the consensus is that that what is likely to be allowed to be patentable in New Zealand um, will be 
we'll look to the UK for precedent, right? So um, that patent law has been around for a much longer time. So we can maybe look at some UK patents um, to see you know, where they're going to draw the line between what qualifies as a computer program as such versus, versus something that's a real invention that's patentable. Um, so I'm about to look at an expired UK patent. Um, is there anyone in the room who does not feel comfortable looking at patent text from an expired patent? All right, good. We're all brave souls here. <laughs> um, so this is a patent by Philips. The title of the patent is Method of Transmitting Audio and or Video Signals. Getting very specific. Um, claim one is a method of transmitting these signals by means of an encoding algorithm comprising some steps. And the steps are you do these things and basically they're saying we can send blocks out of order um, by telling you how long you have to delay decoding the blocks to get them back in the right order. Very innovative stuff. All right. So, did any of you spot the part in there that was not a computer program as such? Oh, yeah, sure, I'll give you another chance. That's true. But algorithms are math, right? You can't patent math. Um, you were close. The answer is it's actually a trick question. There was nothing in there that, that was said it was not a computer program as such. But if you go back and look at the description, um, they, they talk about all of these wonderful things, these magic words. So the invention relates to a method of transmitting audio and or video signals via some transmission medium. And we really don't need to say what. Oh, no, no, well, let's be more specific. More particularly, the transmission medium is constituted by an optically read readable disk. I've never seen a computer with one of those. <laughs> However, the transmission medium may also be a magnetic taper disk, like a hard drive. <laughs> Certainly not, not part of a computer. Or a direct connection between a transmitter and a receiver, you know, like a network cable. Um, and it also relates to the transmission medium on which the audio and or video signals are recorded, you know, like RAM. Um, to an encoding apparatus for transmitting the audio and or video signals, a computer, and to a decoding apparatus for receiving these signals, another computer. So there's, but if you put these words in there, the patent office will look at that and say, oh yeah, that's not a general computer, that's affecting the physical world, there's a transmission medium. Um, and they'll let your patent through. And if you don't know what magic words to put in, you can actually just, your lawyer can just call up the patent examiner and have a nice conversation. The patent examiner will tell you, well, I can't let it go through like this, but if you, if you said this thing instead, then, then that's totally fine. And they will document this in the file wrapper associated with the patent. So you can like see that this happened. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so it turns out that, that when you have people who are, are paid to go out and get patents and to not understand what words mean, um, you wind up with software patents. And maybe these patents aren't really valid, right? But they got granted, so they're presumed to be valid. And you could go around and trying to invalidate them all, but they're really expensive to do that. And there's a lot of them. And that's not the end of it, right? So you say, no, 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 well, maybe we'll, we'll just try to work in a domain where that hasn't happened yet. Maybe just, just New Zealand by itself is fine. Um, but if you wanted to sell a product in the US, so a very common licensing term is that you have to pay the royalties on all copies of software you distribute, even in jurisdictions where there are no enforceable patents. And so this, this problem is really hard to escape from. Now, who are we? Um, so AV1 was made, made by this consortium called the Alliance for Open Media. And I came here and gave a talk about it in 2017, and this is sort of what it looked like then. Um, now it looks like that, so it's roughly doubled in size. There are now 40 members. Um, there are more members in the works who are currently in some stage of the application process. Um, so yeah, there's kind of a lot of us now, and all of the companies um, on, on that slide have dedicated all of their patents to AV1 royalty-free. 
So not, not only are we saying that we're not reading other people's patents, we actually have a lot of our own patents that cover the technology that we made. All right, so now, now the good stuff. How does AV1 work? Um, I gave a talk at LCA in, in the year 2008 that was an hour long that had similar content to what's on this one slide. So I'll try to do the short version. <laughs> um, basically, we're take some input. Um, we're gonna split that input up into blocks in partitions. Um, and then we're gonna try to predict the things that are in each of those blocks, um, either from, from neighboring pixels in the same input frame or from like previous frames that we've already decoded, either way. Um, and then we get this predict prediction residual. And you notice in that residual, like most of the information is gone, right? But there, there, see there are still a few spots where we didn't predict things very well. Um, then we're gonna take each of those blocks and we're gonna apply a transform. And the idea of the transform is that it's gonna move most of the energy in that residual into just a few coefficients. So you can see on the upper left there, there's one coefficient that's kind of big. Um, and there's a few other ones nearby that, that have most of the content of the information in that block. Um, and then we're gonna take those coefficients, which, which can be large, and we're going to make them much smaller. This is the lossy part of lossy compression. You know, in this quantization step through a, a magical process known as division. Um, and that's really all it is. Um, and so you can see after we, we divide by a large constant, and we're left with a bunch of little small numbers and mostly zeros. And it turns out that small numbers are much easier to compress than, than large numbers. Um, and all of that is going to feed into to this entropy coding step, um, which basically I've cleverly represented here as a black box. Um, basically is going to say, you know, you go back to, to Claude Shannon's information theory um, that the, the number of bits required to transmit a message is equal to the negative log two of the probability of that message. So the entropy coding step is gonna try to figure out what the probability of things is, are, and then code them with that minimum, minimum amount of information. All right. Um, then we undo all that stuff and reconstruct the original image. It looks a little bit worse now because we threw away some information in the quantization step. Um, we apply some filters to try to clean up some of the artifacts we introduced. And then we put that in a reference frame buffer and we use all those reference frames to predict future images and also send it to our output device. All right, so nothing here I have said has been specific to AV1 at all. This is how all video codecs work. Um, AV1 does a, a few more bells and whistles in this diagram. Um, it turns out that we can actually downscale the input and then upscale it in the middle of those filters. Um, and then we can also like remove some of the noise in the original and then insert it back in at the end because it turns out noise is really hard to compress but also you can't tell when we just make it up. <laughs> um, so there are a few more bells and whistles in there but that's not really what makes AV1 different from previous generations. So what does make AV1 different from previous generations? And I summarize that in one word and that one word is more. So what do I mean? Um, so that first step, partitioning, if you go look at VP9, which is sort of the, the closest predecessor to AV1, um, you had, had four different block sizes available to start with, um, and you could split those block sizes up, and basically at the top you had four choices of the way to split them, and if you pick the one on the far right there, um, splitting in two quads, then you could recursively split each of those quads in one of four new ways, all the way down until you got to four by four. So actually five block sizes total. Um, you look at AV1, um, there are a lot more choices. And you actually don't have all the choices for all of the levels for detailed technical reasons that have to do with, with hardware implementers not wanting to kill us. Um, but, but you have quite a lot of different ways to split these things up. Um, and also your blocks go all the way up to 128 by 128 now instead of just 64 by 64. Um, but they still all go all the way down to four by four. Um, and actually not shown in this diagram that there are, you can have chroma blocks that are actually two by two because they get subsampled, which you couldn't do in VP9. Um, anyway, so that's one step. You look at, at prediction. So there are two different types of prediction, um, as, I, as I alluded to before. Um, 
you can predict from the pixels within your own frame, and that's called interprediction. So there's just the previous things you've already decoded in the current frame. Um, VP9 had eight different directional modes. You kind of like extend those pixels along a given direction, and also had two different non-directional modes. One of them where it was just flat, and the other one where it kind of was, you know, this, this smooth thing. Um, in AV1, we have a few more. Um, so we actually have 56 directional modes. Um, we have six non-directional modes, even though some of them are horizontally and vertically oriented. Um, we have five different recursive filtering modes where you predict a few pixels, and then you predict more pixels from the pixels you predicted and not your original edge pixels. You don't do it all in one step. Um, there's a, a mode specifically for Chroma, um, which predicts it from the Luma that previous codecs didn't have. Um, when we do these predictions, we gather neighboring pixels from more locations, um, and I'm also going to apply some extra filters to the pixels before we predict from them, um, basically just to make them better predictors. So, yeah, that got a little bit more complicated. So let's talk about interprediction. Um, interprediction in VP9 was, was relatively simple. Um, so you predict. You do your interprediction, which is predicting from other frames, by having a motion vector that points into that frame. And you can predict the motion vector itself by looking at other motion vectors in your current frame or even in previous frames you've decoded. Um, and so VP9 had two of those different motion vector predictors, um, plus you could always use 0, 0. Um, you had three available reference frames to choose from, so it actually had eight different reference frames in the reference frame buffer, but you picked three of them to use at any one time. Um, and each block could use one or two of those at the same time. And if you use two, you just average them together, um, which sometimes makes for a slightly better prediction. Um, and then those, those motion vectors are going to point you know, somewhere in that, that other frame, which might not exactly align on a pixel boundary. So you need to have some way to interpolate between the pixels. Um, and so there are three different selectable filters that you can use to do that interpolation in VP9. All right, so AV1. Um, so we have four different ways of predicting the motion vectors instead of up from just two. Um, we can still use zero, zero, but we also have this additional, additional global motion. So we can actually estimate a global transform for the entire frame and use that as a predictor. Um, instead of just three available reference frames, we can pick from seven. We still only have eight total. Um, we only use, allow you to go up to seven for reasons that have to, may or may not have to do with IP. Um, but the, the reason we still only let you go up to eight total is because that actually influences how much memory you need in your hardware decoders, and we didn't want to make those more expensive. Um, but, but picking for more of them is, is, is fine. Um, it actually does have a little bit of a hardware cost. Um, it will make your encoder slower, because now you have to look at all of them. Um, there are now five different subpel interpolation filters, and you can pick them differently for horizontal interpolation and vertical interp interpolation. Um, we have combined inter and interprediction. So instead of saying I'm going to have you know, two different motion vectors pointed to two different frames, like now I can predict from my neighboring pixels and have a motion vector and blend those together. Um, there are multiple different ways to blend. Instead of just always averaging things, we can actually have blending weights that depend on the pixels that I predicted. Um, we use overlap block motion compensation, um, a particular form called causal overlap block motion compensation. So we actually, instead of just taking the prediction from your current block, you can all say, well, what is my neighbor predicting? And on the edge between those two blocks, you can kind of blend it together. So there's, there's no longer a sharp discontinuity there. Um, we allow warped motion. So now instead of saying, like, I'm going to have one motion vector for this whole block, I actually say, well, what was, what was the motion vector of my neighbor? Let me interpolate the motion vectors between those two blocks. So every pixel now gets its own motion vector. Um, if you know anything about hardware works, that means like, you know, you might think that means you have this, this, you now need to do a memory reference for every pixel instead of loading blocks of pixels at the same time. This would be horrible. Um, but the motion, warp motion is actually really clever and does this as two different shear transforms. Um, and so you can actually, you know, get that done with reasonable complexity. Um, and we also have this thing called the wedge codebook. This is one of the multiple different blending modes. You can take two different predictions for a block, and instead of like, you know, averaging them together over the whole block, you can say, well, I'm going I'm to 
averaged them together weighted by one of these wedge shapes. So now I'm using one of those predictions for, for one half of the block and one of the predictions for the other half, but the, the have part is not aligned to any, any axis or anything like that. Um, and what that means is you can now represent the shapes of the boundaries of different objects in your video um, without splitting all the way down into really tiny blocks. But it's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the transform step. So VP9 had four different transform types. Um, basically a discrete cosine transform and an asymmetric discrete sine transform. And you could sort of combine them in different ways in the horizontal and vertical. Um, there were four different choices that you had and the transform sizes went up to 32 by 32. Um, and you didn't have to have your transform be the same size as your prediction partition, but, but in each prediction partition you had to pick one size and it was always a square size. So let's go look at AV1. So AV1 says, well, we have this discrete cosine transform and we have this asymmetric discrete sine transform. And well, it's asymmetric so we can flip it around and have one that goes the other way. We could also just not transform things, use the identity transform. So that's, that's four different types. And then we can do that independently on the horizontal and the vertical. And so let's just allow all of those. So that's 16 different transform types. Um, the sizes go up to 64 by 64. Um, we don't necessarily mandate that the transforms be square because we have in all of those new, new partitions, we now have a bunch of rectangular size blocks. So let's let the transform be rectangular sized. Um, and instead of making you pick one transform size for the block, like we'll just recursively partition things. Um, so you can actually have totally different transform sizes in different parts of your prediction block. So yeah, so that got a little bit more complicated. Um, quantization relative to the other things actually didn't get that much worse. Um, so quantization parameters in VP9, we, you could have one for Luma, which is the black and white part, and one for Chroma, which is the color part, um, and then one for DC and AC coefficients. So DC coefficients are basically that coefficient in the upper left of the, the transform block um, that sort of represents like the brightness of the block or something like that, and AC sort of tells you where the details in the block are. Um, and those, those, you know, it's reasonable to have different parameters for those. Um, and then you could have up to eight sets of those four parameters um, that you could switch on a block by block basis during the frame. Um, but that was, those were, they were kind of expensive to code those switches and you could only predict them from, by, by saying it's the same as the previous frame. So uh, that didn't actually get used that much. Um, in AV1, we allow six quantization parameters in each of these sets because it turns out those color planes, you have two of them. So you might want to have different choices for what your parameters are. Um, we still only allow up to eight parameter sets per frame, but now we predict um, them based on your neighbors also. So it actually becomes a lot cheaper to code. Um, and hopefully we can use that a bit more. Um, and then there are these additional super block level offsets. So the super blocks are the biggest blocks that we allow. Um, so you can actually just, just add an offset to your quantizers every time you hit a super block. And what that's useful for is, is uh, more, very precise rate targeting because you can start out saying, well, I need to need to quantize this much to hit my bitrate budget at the beginning of the frame and then you get a little bit of the way through it and you say, well, uh, that was actually really bad. Let me fix that. I'm starting to run out of bits. Um, so, you know, a little bit more complicated, but not, not as bad as some of the other things. Um, entropy coding. So what VP9 used was this thing called binary arithmetic coding. Um, basically, you convert every th all of the information that you want to code into a sequence of, of binary values. So they're either zero or one, and you code them one at a time. Um, they have four different banks of probabilities. So the probabilities are what it's estimating to, to try to come up with how much each of those bits, those binary values should cost to code. Um, and it would sort of update those estimates at the end of every frame based on the, the actual symbols that it saw. It would come up with new probabilities. Um, in AV1, we allow multi-symbol arithmetic coding. So what that means is instead of reducing everything to binary values, like we might reduce it to a hexadecimal value, right? One of 16 possibilities. Um, and I gave an explanation for that in, in my LCA talk, in, I think 2015. Um, basically, this gets you some amount of parallelism for free, because like you, you don't have to code as many values because you have more information in each one. Um, there are now eight banks of probabilities one for each reference frame. 
and we associate the probabilities with the reference frames so we can track them easier. Um, but we adapt them on every symbol, so there's more work to do there. Um, so that's entropy coding. Filtering. So VP9, this was really simple. There was a deblocking filter, it got rid of blocking artifacts. Um, it was a fairly large one, so it had 16 line buffers, which basically means you're, you're, when you apply the filter um, in the vertical direction, it had, it looked six, you know, the width of the filter was 16 pixels. Um, so in hardware, when you actually implement this, you need to buffer 16 lines, um, which is actually one of the major costs in hardware. Um, because 16 lines of video is actually quite a lot if you need to put it into fast memory. Um, in AV1, we have three different filters. So we have a deblocking filter. It's actually pretty similar to the one that was in VP9. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, but otherwise similar. Um, we have this constrained directional enhancement filter, um, which I could give an entire talk just about that. Um, basically tries to get rid of deringing artifacts in a smart way. Um, then we have this loop restoration filter, which is itself a combination of two different switchable filters, a Wiener filter and what's known as a self-guided restoration filter. And there are whole papers on those things that you can go look up. Um, but we managed to squeeze all of these things into the same 16 total line buffers so the hardware didn't get any worse. Um, and we did that because hardware yelled at us until we did. And then there's just things that don't really have any analog in VP9. So VP9 had, had what's known as tiles, which are basically ways to split up the frame in that can, so they can be decoded independently. Um, you can do that more flexibly in, in AV1. Um, we have this notion of, of spatial scalability. Um, so you can actually encode, encode frames in multiple different resolutions and predict the larger ones from the smaller ones. Um, the idea of super resolution, which is that, that downscaling and then upscaling thing. Um, super resolution actually, actually means something totally different in a different context, but this is what we call it in AV1. Um, film grain, as I mentioned, the denoising and then inserting new noise. Um, there's a lot more metadata that's stored in the codec. So there's you know, actual information about color spaces that's more than one bit. Um, high dynamic range information. Um, there's a whole buffer model that you can use for for things where you have a rate constrained environment, or if you want to like verify that your decoder can actually decode a stream. Um, and like we added a whole still image format based on, on AV1 called AVIF. So yeah, some more. Um, let's talk a little bit about AV1 deployment. So, so we, we, we froze the bitstream um, back in June of last year. Um, is now already available on YouTube for some videos. Um, there's a cloud encoding solution um, provided by a company called Bitmovin. Um, it's been released in Chrome since October. Um, it's been in F Firefox since last January, uh, but behind a pref. And we're gonna default that to on for various platforms over the next several releases. So I think 65 will turn it on for, for Windows, and then 66 will turn it on for Mac, um, and then, then Linux will probably be shortly after that. And the reason that we're doing that is because we wanted to, to improve our security story in Firefox. Um, so actually we're wrapping the whole entire codec in a sandbox in an external process and it's taken a little bit to get that stuff spun up. Um, it's been in Windows 10 uh, since their October update, um, including in, in Edge, the Edge browser since November. Um, it's been integrated into basically all of the open source projects supporting various different containers. Um, if I didn't list your open source project up there, I'm sorry, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, so it's, it's in a lot of places. The number one question everybody usually has is, when's the hardware support coming? Um, the answer is I don't really know, because they don't give me their product plans. Um, but we did see Socio Next, um, which is a, a Japanese company demonstrated FPGA acceleration at in AWS Summit back in June, so basically at the same time the bitstream was frozen. Um, actual ASIC integration um, is, you know, usually you expect to take 18 to 24 months, so sometime in 2020 I expect you'll, you'll probably start seeing products. Um, I've heard people claim that maybe 2019, but, but I'm not sure if I believe that personally, but I guess we'll see. Um, 
we also wanted to create an optimized software decoder. Um, so I would have actually even called this out specifically in my abstract, except for that this, this project was proposed, funded, and executed and released um, in between the time that we, I pr proposed this talk and actually gave it. Um, basically, AOM you know, develops this reference Im implementation called libAOM. Um, it's usable, but you know, it was highly a product of the standardization effort and is just a reference codec. Uh, you, you know. So we wanted something that was just optimized for speed and had no other purpose. Like, you know, it wasn't going to be used for experimentation on new coding technologies or anything like that. Um, so we sponsored the open source community to go write one. Um, the, the name of the, the codec, name of the decoder is David, which stands for David is an AV1 decoder. <laughs> yes, you can tell it was named by the open source community. <laughs> um, and David is very fast. Um, so this is showing David compared relative to libAOM as the reference on two different Intel chips, or two different x86 chips, I should say. Um, now this is, David is right now currently highly optimized for 8-bit 420 content um, on processors that have AVX2. Um, those, those optimizations are getting better for 10 and 12-bit and SSE3 and other previous uh, um, previous instruction sets for older chips, but you know this already covers quite a lot. As you can see, depending on the video you're looking at and which exact chip you're using, it's anywhere between two and five times faster than libAOM, which is pretty good. Um, and this is all on a four-core machine. It turns out David actually also scales to lots of cores really well. Um, so this is a 32-core AMD machine that we had lying around, and we just started throwing threads at it until we ran out of memory. <laughs> um, and yeah, so the, the blue bars there are libAOM. You can actually see as you start getting too many threads, it actually gets worse. Um, and David just keeps scaling. And, and the reason for that is, is libAOM only actually tries to use um, multiple threads to decode a single frame at a time and still decodes all the frames in sequence. Um, and David is, can do that and then can also decode ahead multiple frames in parallel and, and, and use threads that way. Um, and it can do both of these at the same time. So that's the reason that it scales really well. Um, it even scales really well on ARM V8. Um, so not all of the optimizations for, for ARM are finished. Um, but you can see, like, if you're Apple, the, the one at the far right there, you could actually do 4K, so this is a 1080p video, um, but you can see it gets a big enough frame rate that you could do 4K on a mobile device, which seems kind of crazy. Um, but AV1 encoding um, is, is a slightly different story. So this is a version of a slide from my 2017 talk on AV1. I promised it would get worse. Back then we were 65 times slower <laughs> than the previous generation VP9. And now we are are almost a thousand times slower. So libvpx there is 145th real time, and, and libaom is 145,000th of real time. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, this this was measured uh, back in July, and we've been focusing on you know freezing the bitstream and getting good quality, and not necessarily making things fast. So. This is sort of a graph of the, of the speed of AV1 over the development process. And you can see, like, as we neared the end of that process, we started making things faster again. And it's actually like two orders of magnitude faster than it was at its lowest point. Um, so that's, that's going to improve. Um, and this is a corresponding graph of the quality. Um, the big spike back in February was a bug, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so you can see, like, even as it's continued to get much, much faster, like, the quality hasn't really gone down. And overall, we're about 30% smaller files than, than the previous generation, which is pretty good. Um, we wanted to sort of approach this from the other end, and so we started an encoder of our own called Ravi, and the idea is that we would start out always being fast and then try to make it better over time. So 
So we wrote the encoder in Rust. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why. But the goals were, were we wanted to be faster than libAOM and better than libAOM and ideally same at the, t at the same time. So it's not done yet. That, it wasn't going to be done by this talk. It, it may not be done for, for years yet. Um, so we haven't implemented all the tools. Um, we have, don't have SIMD acceleration for all the things. Um, not all of our decisions are, are the best decisions we could make, and we haven't really done any tuning for, for human visual perception, despite knowing how important that is. But having said all of that, it runs in real time. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a latency um, just because, as you can see, I'm piping it through far too many commands. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can actually get rid of the AOM deck part of that pipe if you have a recent enough VLC because it just supports it, but I don't have that on this laptop. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, there's at least a, a usable, usable product there. And if you look at the quality, um, we are currently much better than 264, but not quite as good as, as VP9 yet. So if you haven't already switched to VP9 um, and you want to jump straight to AV1, like this is not the worst thing you could do, um, we will continue to make it better until it's the best thing you can do, but, but we're not there yet. Um, if you're still using VP9, that's, that's fine. You can keep using VP9. Um, briefly talk about why Rust. We wanted a systems language. Um, we, wanted it to be nice to program in, and we didn't want it to be C++ because that was not nice. Um, I think there's also something that Rust has about being safe or something like that. Um, no, no, quite seriously, like, like it's actually nice to not have to worry about buffer flow overflows all over your code, um, but that wasn't the real reason that we picked it. Um, we picked it for nice ergonomics, like conditional compilation, and say like, are you on x86-64? Are you not on Windows? Like, do I have NASM available? then do this block of code. Like, that's so much nicer than an if def mess. Um, I have real namespaces. Like, I don't have to prefix all of my things with one and two character things. Um, I have real closures. Like, I can just sort, by th sort my things in one line. I have iterators, right? Like, so I'm computing the costs. I'm, you know, c cost for my current things, the sum of my costs plus the, the cost of all my children. It's one line of code. That's not one line in C. Um, there are, there are generics, you know, which, you know, you, you have this in C++ with the templates, right? But in Rust, like, I can say I have a pixel, and the pixel, uh, my pixel trait is going to be a primitive integer, and I'm going to be able to convert it into signed and unsigned 32-bit values, and, and also just cast it directly, and I don't know what that static thing is. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't actually know Rust, even though I develop in it. <laughs> Lifetimes are hard. Um, but then you're like, you go look, I can now write a function which takes a parameter t, and I say t is going to be pixels. Now I know it has all these types, and I can even add like constraints on other types based on t. So I'm going to say like, I'm, I want to be able to cast my type t to an, an, an i32. Um, and I can write those as constraints as part of the generic, and unlike C++ templates where, you know, like if, if you're typed, you try to pass into the template, doesn't actually support all the things the template uses, like it just fails to compile, but you can't look at the code and know what things those are you actually need. Like in Rust, I can tell you, you must have these things, and if I don't have those things, like it won't even try to compile the code regardless of whether anyone uses it. Um, Rust doesn't support allowing you to have constants be parameters, which is a kind of a thing that we'd like, um, but I can have constants belong to a trait. And then I can just chain these things together. And so now I can say I have a generic which uses this type, and the type has the constants I need. And so really, you can actually do all this fine. Um, and I'm running out of time, so I won't go into that in too detail. Rust is not perfect. Um, Rust requires everything to be explicitly cast. There are no implicit type conversions, which you know that, that, that may or may not be OK. But this casting operator using as is really ugly to me. And I should point out that this is just my personal opinion, like not Mozilla's opinion. I'm not on the Rust team. If I hurt anybody's feelings, I'm sorry. Um, but like, look at that last as U32. So someone in here who does not know Rust, 
what value is being cast with that last as? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah, so you would hope, so I got one, I would hope the whole thing, and one NMS minus one, and the second one is correct. <laughs> yeah, that, I feel like that could have been done better, but it is what it is. Um, Rust bounds checks every array access, and like for normal people, that's probably fine. Um, we do a lot of per pixel access, which seems like it could be really be a problem, um, but it turns out not so much because all that's gonna be done in SIMD with assembly anyway, so it's fine. Um, kind of the bigger deal is, is 2D buffers. So Rust borrow checker only lets you have one mutable reference to an array at a time. And they have convenience functions if you have a 1D array, like you can split it up into chunks that are all independent, and now you can have mutable references to each one, but nothing when I want to take a 2D block out of an array, so that's kind of hard. Um, but the answer is like you just throw some unsafe code at it and it's fine. <laughs> um, and at least like you know, like the unsafe part is now constrained to that one little bit. Um, and so we can solve that. Um, there are more encoders besides ours in the works. Um, so there's an open source one that has been announced by Intel but not actually open sourced yet. And sort of the strategy they're taking is like these guys already have encoders for other formats and they're gonna now make an encoder for AV1 out of them so they're not gonna support all the AV1 tools out of the box but you know like they'll grow into that. So that's like a third way you could approach developing an encoder. Um, Socio Next, I mentioned, they claim they developed their encoder in 1.5 months. I have no idea what they did, but they probably did what I just said. Um, there's a, a company called Two Orioles that makes an encoder called Eve for VP9. Um, they are now making one for AV1. Um, I'm not sure it's done yet, but I think if you go talk to them, you could buy some version of it. Um, NG Codec is gonna make a closed source one. Every hardware and vendor in AOM is gonna make one. And there's probably even more that I don't know about. So, so I'm absolutely out of time now. AV1 is a big advance over previous codecs. Anybody can deploy it without asking for permission. Fast decoding is already here. Encoding coming soon. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. We have time for one question. One and only one, and not a very big one. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. We are Thank honored you. to have you here, and we'll see you for 10 minutes for the next talk.